because I was a starter. At, at, 60, mm. at 64, I, 65, I think it was when I started. And she set me off, your mum, didn't you? I thought you were both. A long, long time ago, when I was in my 40s, wasn't I? And of course, you know where Reg lives in Wakefield? At the bottom of his garden, there was this fella who kept nipping in and looking in, uh, into this shed or whatever it was at the bottom of the garden. Barbara asked me what he was up to. He said, well, he makes violins. So, of course, that, that was it. We went down to visit Reg and we went round to his house, didn't we? And I had a look at him and I had a chat with him. He made some nice fiddles as well. So the uh, development was done in uh, Italy in the 16th and 17th century. Stradivari was one, is one of the most famous makers, uh, and uh, Guarneri was another famous maker. This model is a Guarneri model. This is the main part of the, the box of the violin. There's a resonating box. This is the front of the violin, or more often termed the the, the belly. The whole thing resonates when you're playing. These are the F holes which allow the sound to come out and they also affect the, uh, the, also, the flexibility of the top plate. That leaves us with the neck and the scroll. That's one piece there, all carved out to one piece of wood. People take a lot of pride in how that looks when it's made. It takes quite a bit of hand carving. Then the strings come would come up here and into the, into the peg box here. These are the pegs. The strings come from the peg box over this nut. This is called the nut. The strings go over there and travel right down and over the bridge which is, would be situated there. And then the strings come over there and then connect into this piece here which is the tail piece. Right, this, that's the peg at the end. The end peg it's called. And the tailpiece hooks onto that like that. This is called this bit here where the string comes over. There's quite a lot of tension, and so a piece of wood is put in there, a hard piece of wood, which is ebony. That is there because ordinary wood would, would, would distort. This is very hard wood. There's considerable tension between there and there. As the string comes over the bridge, there's a lot of weight down onto the bridge, onto the uh, top of the, the belly of the fiddle. Two things are there to, to help take the weight. Inside the violin is a, about here, just behind the bridge position, and under the this left the right hand leg, there's a sound post it, that props the get the, the top of the violin against the, the back of the back, but also it carries the vibrations from the strings down onto the back of the fiddle. Underneath this here which you can't see, but underneath, from about there down to there, there's another piece of wood which is glued onto the underside, and it's shaped like that. Now that, again, has two purposes. A, to stop the bridge, help the uh, fiddle from collapsing, and also to take the sound from the other leg of the bridge 
and transmit the sound along the violin to these to the ends. The ends of the violin here are the, the call of the lungs. When the uh, bow is put, uh, drawn across the string, the string vibrates from side to side, causing this vibration. And that vibration goes through the ridge, into these plates, into the sound post, into the sound bar, which is the bass bar, which goes along here, and causes these bits here and here, here and here, to vibrate. The thickness of the these, the, this end is never more than about two and a half millimeters thick. There, the, in fact, the whole of the the whole of the belly of the violin is about the same thickness. Unlike the back, which has got a varied thickness, it's thin down there, thicker there, thin there, thicker there, and the strongest part, the, the thickest part, is like a, an oval shape there. These, all these bits, are, the ribs, or the sections of the ribs, are called, that's the top section of the ribs, and that's top out, top left, top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left out, and they're bent outwards, but the seat belt is bent inwards. This model is a Guarneri model, and it's got a, a longer seat belt. The Stradivari is a shorter one. And how it affects the sound, I don't know, but it does affect the sound. The, uh, the main woods for the violin are uh, maple, because it's got a, a beautiful figurine to it. You can see it from there, and the one that's being drawn. It joined two pieces of wood together to make, uh, the joint down the middle, to make the one piece. That's the back of the violin. The other piece is the belly which starts out as two pieces like that, which have got to be joined together. And this is a sample of how, it, how you would buy it. It looks like that. Uh, it comes as one piece joined there, and then you have to split it to make it. That's so that when you stick them together, you've got a balance of wood. The wood is the same there as it is there. Straight grain, no knots. Uh, an even grain all the way down because that matters a lot when you're actually carving the thing. So you've got to then to make a make that joint pretty good. It's got to be ex it's got to be exceedingly good because you've, you've got to form one piece of timber out of it. Check that it's square and it isn't it. There's nowhere near. So I've got to take more off that side. And then eventually, what's this side like? So I've got to get it square and dead flat, dead level, and then put those two sides together like that to make the joint. Now, it's hopeless there, it's a mile out. Eventually, if it's a good, if it's a good fit, you could, uh, all you do is put a bit of glue on there, and a bit of glue on there, like that. And then you put the two edges together where you've got a bit, a bit of glue on, and you rub them together like that, and they stick. The evangelist stick. You don't really have to clamp them. When they glued together, it would then look at like something like that. There's a joint all the way down there. Excellent joint there. These timbers are special timbers in that they, they, from, they resonate. Uh, you can hear now, if I tap this like this, it gives you a note. It's like, oh, it's somewhere else. It's not the same. It doesn't ring the same. That rings nicely, doesn't it? So that's a good piece of wood for a fiddle. The, the, the note is... That's C, that would be a D. That's a, a good piece of timber because it, it's got 
that resonating quality. It's also good because it's a nice even grain, no knots or anything in it. Excellent joint. Yes, yeah, right, okay. as I've said before. <laughs> so to get that in. The same procedure for the back, but uh, this time you don't I haven't got two separate pieces of wood. This is maple. I've made the joint there, ready for making the shape of the violin. And this also is near enough the same. Yeah, wood. it is, yeah. But that's the sort of sound you a good piece of wood would, would make. It, it's a fully joined. If it wasn't joined properly, you wouldn't get a ring to it. Yeah. It's like it would be like tap the side of a cracked cup. I'll tell you what note it is. It's a G. That's CG. Anyway, that's the rough that's the rough timber before we start the work on it. It's rough there, you can saw marks, and that's all before we go anywhere at all with this, what we've got to do is plane that out so we get dead flat. Flat that way, flat way, flat every di every direction. And when it's flat, then you can start working on it. Strips of maple, you can tell by the, the figuring down the on the around the edges. Yeah. Uh, that comes down, that comes in strips like like that. And then they've got to be thinned down to about a millimetre, and then they've got to be bent round the former. This is the this is the mold, what we call the mold. That's the the, the the former for the violin anyway. And we fasten that down there and put some screws through just to hold it on this. Then we put in what we call the corner blocks. And one that's been done. These are the corner block corner blocks here. See these bits here. They are the things that hold the ribs in place. When the, when those corner blocks are in, then you mark the corner blocks and the end of here and then when you've got those blocks in and got the marks on then you cut those back so you get the full profile for the bending see that those bits there those are the, those are the corner blocks and those are the end blocks um, and once you've got them in there and you've marked them out with that uh, former then you cut them with a chisel the first pin I put in would be that way one of those, and I'd glue it to the corner block. That's one of those, more or less. So I'd glue that to the corner block there. There. Those are the first bits you glue in. When you've done that, you then bend these ribs, and you fasten them onto the onto the end block there, and the end block there. These have been bent bent on a bending on a bending iron. So that would that would form that would form that bit there. But yeah, what you have to do is keep taking it off and putting it on until you get the right exactly the right bend. When you've got that, this becomes the template to mark out the wood for the back of the front. You've got the centre line here, which is that centre line. You place that on that centre line there. When you've clamped it, then you put, you get a you, you go around with your pencil and mark out the shape of the wood plus two millimetres and by doing that you, you do that with a washer and that guarantees that it's two millimetres bigger than the, than that. So that's giving you the, then, the basic shape in this case for the front you do that for the back as well.
remember that this piece of wood is about 20 millimeters thick and we've got to re reduce uh, the, the side and create a shelf all the way around that on that piece of wood four millimeters thick this is so we can get the what they call the purfling in this has got this uh, inset all the way around that's a bit of purfling it's a it's three pieces of wood or fiber or something like that glued together now we've got to cut a groove just wide enough for that to fit into it's easier on a piece of straight wood to go around the curves especially around the around the corners it, it becomes rather difficult um, it's actually easier to do it in the hardwood than it is in the soft it's, it's probably harder to cut but it's, it's it's easier to get good edges with this you could you could be uh, you know as well wood this hard bits and soft bits because mm. of the graining the, the soft wood tends to break away too easily you've got to make blend that corner and that corner in if you go too wide you see here you've got little blemishes here and at the corner it's, it's gone too wide there but this isn't one of mine Mr Stradivari would have took that out I'm thinking of throwing it out anyway because I don't like the Mm. This piece down the wood, it's a nice piece of wood, but of course it's got this fault in it. wood there is here yep. you'd cut that out you put you can put a groove and then you come around with this with your little plane you'd work down to that depth and to make, right, and that would go all the way around like that and gradually you'd, you'd take off that ex surplus wood all the way around that to five millis. That's it. And you proceed to go around your fiddle then, like this. See, it's obviously wrong there, isn't it? There's too much wood there. And you finish it with a pen pencil pattern all the way around. That side's got to be equal to that. And it's got to be a, a smooth flow around, all the way around like that. So obviously it dips in a bit there, so the, the, uh, it's got to be the same level as that. So I've got to work that down there until that comes down. By taking the wood in, that contour, which is what it is there really, that contour moves in. See how it's moved from there to there? Well, it's not still not far enough because it's got to match up with that there. But remember, that's the main arch. It's got to match up there. In. So it's still got a little way to go, hasn't it? To come up to, it's got to go into about there somewhere. But that would have to be all the way around. Well, to do that, by the way, you wouldn't be on a flat wood. These are all special bits you make. That would be secured in there with a clip and clap on it. otherwise I'll cut it into the main arm.
because you can feel the way you've got to take it. You can, you can feel, the, feel the high spots. spot those onto the onto the top of the violin and then you you, you drill through with a two two millimeter diameter drill and then you put that through the hole and it cuts the circle you've got to use that to position the the two holes but that gives you the center of the hole the, the guide hole for that thing there and there that will be that one and it cuts the, it cuts so so far. Then you come through from the other side and cut back, and then it takes that little hole out, that, that one. That's the block to make the neck out of. Long way to go yet. Now this way it's important to just dead square. So I'll put it there and I'll mark that across there. Right. That's the decent point of the whole thing. And there's a point on there that's got to come in line with that. That's the point, point there. And then that goes there. There. And i put another one. Then I get another one of these, and then I go through each one of those to mark the, the scroll. So I work from that side, like that. I don't work. You don't never work. I don't want to break out at the far end, you see. So I've seen a pencil mark up from down to. What you do on these, you do one side first, and then copy it from the other side, measure it on and balance it out from the, the one you're doing on the other side. So you can see it's a slow process anyway, working around. Article. This is number. This complete art. This is a um, uh, a coronary, I think. Yes. This is a strad model. This is a good coronary model. 
to anybody who didn't make them or didn't play them, it's very difficult to choose between. Yeah, there's not, not a lot of difference. The varnish they put on, they put, it's, the colour is not, you don't stain the wood at all, you just put the colour, the colour comes into the varnish and, and you can vary the colour by how many coats were. Each of these has got about, I would say, at least 10 coats on. Um, to get that sort of colour. If you want to go any darker, you'd have to get a darker colour um, varnish. That's unvarnished. A different lot of difference is it's, it's a brighter sound they always say with it with this with a strategy stroke it with a uh, uh, with a granary you've got to work at it it's higher pressure bolt pressures and things like that on it. But that's the difference that's a lovely top see this the wood yeah. grain is gorgeous so what number is that one one of the late ones isn't it 19 that's 15 i think but that's i, I think that's gorgeous if you look down there, you can the fact that it's highly polished picks out any undulations that you don't want. Yeah. <laughs> the bow, essential part of violin playing. This is uh, stroked across the string, and it sort of sticks to the string and pulls it and releases it very, very quickly. It's, it's not smooth. This is horsehair, and if you look at it through a microscope, it's like little waves. You put resin onto that and it helps grip the string onto the, the uh, bow onto the string. When it's not in use, the, uh, it's re the, the tension is released by this screw at the end here. Uh, when you tighten the screw, it draws this block at the end backwards and tensions the string, and you'll see that the bow begins to straighten out, the wood part begins to straighten out. So a bigger gap occurs between the, the bow and the string. Uh, and the oh, it's his horsehair, by the way, horsehair, and that's what gives you the tension. It's made out of a wood from um, South America called Pernambuco, and it's a good strong bow. Um, the re reason they use Pernambuco because it's got it's very springy wood, Str very strong and very springy, and that's the reason they use it. This bow uh, was rescued from a a dump. Uh, you remember the g gillet, gillet, uh, gillets. gillets. Yes. Well, I was to I, I went down to the to see. His, I was talking about getting some wood for uh, some staging for a greenhouse, and it's always says I've got plenty. So I went down, and he got this stack of wood that he got from his dad's. And amongst the this stack of wood was this bow, looking very black and mucky, and. Uh, he says, do you want that? Oh, he's a violin boy. He says, do you want it? I said, no. He says, it's terrible. It doesn't look much good, does it? In fact, uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll have it. And I'll, I'll have it repaired for probably a pupil. And I took it into a uh, fellow who did just the, the uh, hair restoring, you know, hair, not restoring, hair replacement. 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 <laughs> I'm getting carried away, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and he says, uh, I said, what's it worth then? And they said, these are all silver. It's a silver, what you call a silver mounted bow. He said, oh, I'll give you 25 quid for it. As it is. And it, it had got no hair on. They, all these were black and mucky. And I said, well, if this, I said, well, in that case, I'll keep it. So I did repair it. And if this, it's got a slight damage just there. Just, can you see just there, a little mark on the bow where it's been caught on something? If it wasn't for that, that bow would be worth these days about two or three hundred quid. It's, it's made in. It was made in Dresden by uh, Richard Vicol, Reichold or something, which was stamped down there. But it's, but it's a good bow. I played this. I've used this bow for oh, 45, 40 years, I would say, at least. 
bought another one recently, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's any better than this. I don't think it is actually. Anyway, that's the end of the story.